We're going to be in 1 Corinthians today. We're doing a uh, sermon series on 1 Corinthians. This is the second sermon on 1 Corinthians. If you missed last week and you're a friend of us on Facebook, First Baptist Church of Farmer City, you can find last week's message there a whole host of others. We got a new camera. Greg has done a really good job editing and making sure that those get put on, and they the clarity looks awesome. As you all know, in preparation into getting this new camera, that's why I lost the weight, because I heard that these new cameras put extra weight on you, so I wanted to slim up so I didn't look too large on film. So there is a drawback I found out, and I, my wife left right now, um, I was a 34 in the waist. I'm now a 29. I don't have any suits left. I'm thinking of gaining the weight back just so I can wear clothes. I didn't think this through at all. So I'm wearing my son's clothes now. No, I had a few, just like one suit from way back when, but whatever, so we'll get there. It's like, man, and they charge a lot of money for that. I'm going to talk about division today. Division, 1 Corinthians 1, I will read from, uh, 10 through 17 in a second. Let me just give you a little background right now, and um, uh, heads up, we also did not mention Brooke. She had surgery this week, and she is recovering. And I know we got other families traveling or whatever, but remember Brooke as she also goes through the healing process too. So um, I hate the sin of division. Is there anyone here who has ever been part or associated with a church that was divided? A few of you. I absolutely 100% hate the sin of division. Division in marriage, I would imagine you all know this, is very destructive. Uh, uh, in my counseling sessions, I warn people right away. If I find that they are divided, one's going this way, one's going that way, I, I, I get the words out there really quick. You guys cannot stand. You guys will go through your marriage and you will may not end up at the same place when it's all over. Very dangerous. Very dangerous in a church as well. I was born into a divided church. What do I mean by that? The pastor who led me to Christ two weeks after I was led to Christ and baptized resigned from the church. I thought it was because of me. He was sorry. Maybe that's what it was. I quickly come to realize that the church that I was involved with, um, you really couldn't see it unless you went to their business meetings or, 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 or you were around, you, you started associating with the group. I was just like a Sunday morning Christian, and I really couldn't see it. But, the, but as, I, as I came to Christ and I immersed myself into the church and I started going to the Sunday schools and I started really getting to know, to know the people, I was amazed how divided this church was. This church, they had several pastors. They had two pastors um, uh, in particular that were at war with each other. Deacons pick sides. Some deacons was for the head pastor and other deacons was for the music pastor. I remember going to business meetings and, and we would be sitting there I mean we've had our business meetings here are actually more are a little more docile than I would like a little like a little bit of interaction um, even some objection every now and then uh, were a little bit too close on that but I remember I was sitting next to one deacon and as soon as one person spoke and again you were either identified with group A or you were group B we called group A the group and I believe group B was called the family so it was the group versus the family. So if somebody from the group stood up at a business meeting, somebody from the group of the family would automatically, you couldn't see it, but it was as if they did one of these numbers, right? They would stop listening and they would begin to overheat 
blood pressures would rise and they would formulate arguments and debates. It doesn't matter what the person from the group or it doesn't matter what the person from the family was saying. As soon as they spoke, it was there. I remember one deacon, he was sitting there and as soon as this person, the group, I don't remember if he was from the group or from the family, but as soon as he started talking, his leg just started, it was just like a little puppy dog or something. His, his leg started kicking up and he was just, he was seething. Ready to pounce as soon as they got done talking. I thought that was normal. You ever grow up in a in, in, in a home that is just just dysfunctional? That's what you think is normal. You couldn't pay me enough money today to go to a church that I know was divided. And on my own power, I want you to listen to the words I say very carefully. Try to pull them out. Because the moment you speak, regardless of what you said, the moment you speak, whichever side you sounded the most like, you would automatically be associated with that side. And your words would fall on deaf ears. Weeks before I left, before I sent my letter, saying, I just, I love you all, God bless you, I'll pray for you. And that's how, and that's how I, I left. I left on very good terms. Um, I remember a lady, and she's since gone, accusing the other side as having the devil with them. Do you know what happens once you bring Satan into it? You're so far gone. I don't think you can be saved other than the miraculous. The only way that I would go to a church that was divided would be if God directed me towards them, and I would be going under protest. I'm sure I would be thrown up on their shores as Jonah was thrown up on the shores of Nineveh. It was devastating. Devastating. I remember one young lady, and she's, she's still in the church. Not in this church, but she's still a member of the church. You know what the church is, right? It's the body of belief. It, it is all of Christianity. If you are a Christian, you are a member of the church, of the body. She's still in the church. She, she was probably 15, 16 years old, and we were, we were having these business meetings that would last for hours, the screaming and the yelling and the tears. And, and one lady stood up, and she was 15, 16, and she, and she made this comment. She said, we are Christians. We shouldn't even disagree. Is that right? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. I hate, hate division, the inside of the church. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, 1 Corinthians verse 10. Before I read these, I want to give you a quick outline of the Corinthian church, very quick. There are two sections. One, we have a church with a lot of problems. We have the problems in which Paul heard of, okay? Somebody was telling him about. Somebody in the church was contacting Paul and saying, these are the particular problems. And as we go through the study, we're going to see these problems come up over and over and over again. One of the problems was um, sexual immorality. You'll see that starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, another one of the problems was, well, they were getting drunk when they were supposed to be doing the Lord's Supper. And we'll see that coming up probably much later in the sermon series. We have um, the core problem is, is division. What I like about what the Apostle Paul, and you'll see this here in a second, is he names the person that told him this. You want to, you, you here's a quick little tidbit, if you will, of, 
of truth, if you'll take this in your life and, and you will adopt it to your life and you will apply it and every time you hear somebody talk about something, you apply this to your life, you will grow exponentially in your maturity. Never listen to anything from anybody that you're not willing to take to the person that they're talking about with their name. Once people know that about you, gossip will stop. One. And two, if it's wrong, the untruth will, will be found out. I do not like it when people come up to me and say, I have a little piece of information I'd like you to know, but you can't tell anyone that I told you. And the first thing I say to them is, was, I am going to tell them that you told me. Why? Because I hate gossip. Not as much as division, but I definitely hate it. In verse 10, the other part of the 1 Corinthians letter is what they wrote about. The Corinthian church wrote Paul about to it. So we start. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that, you may be no, so that there may be no divisions amongst you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. And another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. There are four questions I, I want to go over with you real quick, and I'm going to try to attempt. Actually, there are five questions, uh, and I'm going to try to attempt to answer it from this letter and from the gospels in general, 1 Corinthians overall specifically. Question number one is this. What should we not read into this portion? Number two, what does, what does disunity bring about? Number three, what does unity look like? Number four, what is at the heart of division and unity? And number five, what shall we do? There are two commands I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17, and they are really simple. One is specific. It says this, be united. The other one is implied by adding 1 Corinthians 3 with it, be mature. First question, what should we not read into this, per this portion? What does unity not look like? Number one, unity does not mean uniform. How many... Is, and please raise a hand. You ever come from a church where everybody's wearing the same outfits? I see one arm go up in the back really quick. The, what type of clothing did they wear there? They wore clothing, right, Darren? Yes. Amen. So, because there's those type of churches where you go in and nobody's wearing anything. That's definitely uniformed. Um, anybody go to one of those churches? Just Paula and, and Greg? <laughs> Dana, you went to a naked church? No. Oh, okay, good. That was before I met her. <laughs> She's not listening to the question. So, Darren, you, you went to a church with a uniform. It, was it the dress? Women, women wore the... Yeah, women wore dresses. Men wore suits and women wore the dresses. One of you told me about a church that you went to one time or a church you belonged to that they had, what, ties in the back? Or if you came into the church, immediately they would say, whoa, stop, just a second. Was it clip-ons? Because Randy's shaking your head. Was it clip-ons or regular ties? Regular ties, a jacket and stuff where you wear the same thing? Um, should, should we, is it, okay, is it wrong to wear jackets, ties? I hope not. No, absolutely not. I think that there should be I, I, a little bit of respect, I guess. I don't have any problem with that. I, I do preach and teach this. If somebody were to come in and, and they had holes in their jeans, we don't judge them. Uh, that may be the best clothes that they have, number one. And two, we're really not setting up those rules and laws. But what I guess the point I want to make is that just because Paul says right here that we're, to, that, that we're not to be divided, it doesn't mean that we are to dress 
uniformly. In fact, when I go into a church and everyone's dressing the same way, they're talking the same way, they're thinking the same way, they got the same rules, the same regulations, two things pop to my mind. First, this church is legalistic, okay? Now, that's the best that can happen. Second, it's a cult. I don't want to stay around to find out if it's a cult and I have to drink pink Kool-Aid or something. So I run away from churches like that, but there shouldn't be different clothes and different or, or the same clothes or anything like that. Paul's not saying that. What else doesn't it say right here? Um, real quick, did you know diversity in the church is a good thing? You all know that, right? How many of you like contemporary music, Christian music? Two, three, four, some of you right there. How many tradition? And that's it right there. Traditional music, one, two, three. Southern gospel, that's it. You could, you will take your shoes off and do a little clog dance to southern gospel music, right? How many dancing on, how many of you dancing inside the church was, was, was a bad thing? Anybody? Dancing on the inside of the church was a bad thing? There's a couple of you. You ever see Footloose? The Southern Baptist preacher? Yeah, that's me. No dancing. I, I'm okay with dancing. I just can't dance. So, um, But diversity in the church is a good thing. I think with, with everything, spiritual gifts. How many of you right now have a spiritual gift? Who has a spiritual gift of, of prophecy? Anybody? Randy, you're teaching. How about mercy? How many of you are a compassionate person? Now, you raised your hand, and your son disagreed. No, he... Okay, I'm just wondering. You agree your mom's compassionate? If you have to ask, take it from somebody who knows. Am I compassionate? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's just, that was a sermon between, I can relate to this man. The Bible actually says, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 17, 20 says, If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but, many, uh, but one body. Diversity is good. Here's something else unity is not. Unity is not a suicide pack. Unity is not a suicide pack. How many of you do business meetings or you do meetings maybe once a week or once a month right there? How many of you love those meetings where everybody agrees with everybody? We're smiling, we're, we go in, the minute the first guy speaks, everybody says, yes, that's the way to go, following you. Anybody? You like those meetings? Those are some of the most dangerous meetings ever. I call that the suicide pack. People are afraid to death to disagree with somebody. In churches, he's the pastor. He can't be wrong. Churches like that go off the cliff. Because the Bible even tells you, plans fail for the lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. What should we not read into this portion Division is, does not mean we are to not be non-confrontational. There's a church here, Southern Baptist Church. Randy's got an article uh, from our, uh, that quotes the Southern Baptist president right now. But there was a church in, in not our association, um, local association, but our overall association down south where a black couple wanted to get married. They were attending the church. They went up to the pastor and said, would you marry us? Pastor says, well, you know what? We got, we got certain rules here that, you know, that, and uh, you, you, it's not really rules. It's just little guidelines. One, you got to seek my counsel. Two, you got to be in Christ. And then he just set out the guidelines. He says, yes, we agreed all that's no, it's not really a problem. Pastor said, I'll marry you, but I need to bring it to the church because here at church we're a congregation. and we kind of we kind of just ask these questions, and the church has to agree on it. It shouldn't be any problem. So he brought it to the church, and there was a small number of Christians on the inside of the church, not the majority, but definitely in leadership, that said, this church has never married 
a black couple. So we don't want to just move into this. We will not marry the black couple. The media got this, and they were on this like white on rice. And all you see, for whatever reason, is Baptists and their racist agenda. Pastor actually talked to him and said, listen, I, this, this church is there, and this is kind of what they decided. This is kind of how it works, congregationalist. So I'm gonna, we can go down the street, and I'll marry you if that's not a problem. Then this couple say that's not a problem. It's not an issue. We don't, really don't want to make it an issue. Of course, the damage is done because the whole nation knows about it. The article that Randy has, and he can, he can send it to you, is really the Southern Baptist pastor or um, the president's response to this, it, You know, trying to communicate to the world that you know what this does not represent us. Here's the point of asking. You know what it would have been nice to have? A pastor with a backbone. You say, you have crossed the line and you will not cross this. You'll fire me before I obey that. Why? Because it was wrong. I was with one church and there was a minister that, that went up and did just said some ungodly things to a young person. This person was in tears and came to me. I went to another head pastor, and I said, this, this pastor's crossed the line. They, they, they've done this. We need to go up to him. We need to confront him. Here's what the Bible says. We need to go up to him. And, and, and it says, you know, we, we've already talked to him once, and, and, and he's not repenting, so we need to go up there. And this pastor said, I am not doing that. non-confrontational it's cowardly and it's unbiblical did peter get opposed by paul in the bible when he was acting outside the gospels absolutely peter was was agreeing with the judaizer says nope you gotta you gotta live a certain way you gotta do this you gotta do this you gotta do this and he was he was totally rejecting the Gentile. And Paul called him on it and says, you, you, you are acting like, like a Jew right now. And you know the grace of God. Get with the program. Paul, he confronted in 1 Corinthians. You're divided on this. Division does not mean non-confrontational. So what does disunity bring about? You know, that lady, that young, that, she's an older lady, um, she, uh, here we are, we were divided, and, and, and one group went to the other group, and this lady, who was like one of the leaders in the group, says, the devil's just laughing at this. He's got you guys controlled, and you're just like, you know what, shut up. The devil doesn't care one iota about our church. Do you think he's really worried about us? We haven't preached the gospel outside these doors in years. Why? We've got to get our own house in order. Why? Because we're a bunch of goofballs. You're not going outside proclaiming Jesus Christ. You don't want to bring people in. The only time people are bringing in is so you can put them on your team and you can win. I think Satan's down the street in his local bar with this demon brother say, saying, Dude, man. What about this place, man? They might get their act together. No, I think he was worried about other people and other places, those people out there that are out there with the message of the gospel, all right? He's worried about individuals, and I'm, of course I'm talking generally, of the spiritual warfare. doesn't really care about divided churches because divided churches simply cannot stand. They're stagnant, number one. Another thing disunity brings about is this. Self-destruction. Galatians 5.15. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, for you, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. It amazes me that you go to uh, the one church that I know is divided. And to this day, all of the key players, all of the key fighters, all of the key, the, the key people who wanted to win, 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 when they finally won, the church shut down. Why? Because they won and they killed everybody off. The 12 of us won. And there was nobody left. 
Good luck with that. Now, the, everything about your, your Christianity, all you knew was fighting. They had to find a bigger place. It was the fight that mattered, not the gospel. Three scars, what disunity brings about. Scars that deforms the body and makes it look less attractive to seekers. There was a photo I saw the other day on Chick-fil-A. It was a picture, um, no, excuse me, a photo I saw on Facebook of Chick-fil-A. It had people wrapped around the building and everyone was going, I really, somebody needs to buy me one of these sandwiches. Because, I mean, it looks, Nate, you testified to the thing. I mean, apparently they're the best sandwiches on the face of Illinois. I don't know. Do we have any in, in Illinois? One, there's one in Champagne. Okay, I have to, I have to try. Darren, you're raising your hand. All right, so they're they're around. I need to check one of these out. So um, I, I like their stand on um, on on the institution of of marriage, and it was a very positive stance. Says, you know what, I support traditional marriage. And then, of course, you, you all know the war that came about on them. But anyway, there's a picture of Chick Fil A right there, and there's people lined up around them. And then there was there was these words they put on the picture that says. You won't find half of these people serving at a food bank or a clothing bank on any given day. And that's actually what Jesus said. And I was thinking, first, I don't know if Jesus ever said the word food bank or anything like that. I mean, I'm not being technical, but you guys know me. I get technical. I was noticing the Christians that were posting these pictures. I work at a food bank, and you would be surprised the number of Christians that go there when people aren't looking. I'll tell them, Brother Eric and Kim, they were at Salt Light yesterday for a couple hours. Eric and Kim, they've, they've moved on. They, they're living in Champaign right now, so they're attending a, a church in Champaign. They serve there. Be surprised how many Christians serve there. But what, what really ticked me off about this is here we have a Christian that, that, that has this philosophy or this idea or this animosity towards what other Christians are doing with their life and they're putting it out there in, in such a way that damages the face of the church. If I have an argument or a disagreement with other Christians and I bring it before the ungodly, if you will. I do damage, scars. Question number three. What does unity look like? We were talking about in our Sunday school today about the Jehovah Witnesses, and I remember 1 Corinthians, if you've ever debated with 1 Corinthians, they will, or not 1 Corinthians, they no longer exist, um, the church, this church in Corinth, a Jehovah Witness um, informed me that they are the only true church because they are not divided, where Christians generally are divided. And of course, if you take a look at 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul calls these people in this church Christians. He calls them saints. He calls them saved. He calls them true Christians, but yet they were divided. So that's absolutely not false. You would be surprised, though, what Christians do agree on for the most part. And, and here it is. Christians should be united on the fundamentals of our faith. And within Christianity, there are fundamentals that we do agree on, that we're united. I would say, number one, one of them is the inerrancy of the Scriptures, the Gospels. I think that we should all come to a conclusion that the Scriptures, I mean, it made the promise. It says that, that it's from God. It says all Scriptures God breathed. It says no prophet came about by his own interpretation. This wasn't one guy waking up one day and looking at a flower and saying, it inspires me to tell you something about God. It says it came from God, and I think those who are in Christ believe what it says. They, they believe what it says. There are things about it that you believe in. I believe, and I'm again, maybe this is just part of my study, but I believe the Trinity is is part of that. Those are fundamental doctrines that all Christian Christians should agree on. Who Jesus is, 
Jesus said that. Unless you say that I am he, you will indeed die in your sin. We have to agree on these things. And some of you said, well, I know lots of Christians who don't agree with that. No, if they don't agree who Jesus says, who he says he is, they're not Christian. There's something else. It's not that we have a difference of opinion. It's that they're not Christian. If they say Jesus is a good teacher, you, you call yourself, I don't care, moonwalker, but it doesn't matter. It's not who you are. To be a Christian, you need to identify yourself with who Christ said it is. We have to agree on these things. We have to agree on the gospel. I believe that we need to agree on the fact that there's only one way to heaven. Well, there are many ways to heaven. Well, there are many people you can date while you're married, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing marriage right. I assure you that if you accept and embrace these other gods that don't exist, the Bible says they don't exist, you're a polygamist in your relationship, and God doesn't take too kindly to sharing. Shelf. I do think that there are doctrines that we do not need to fight about that are not primary. There are secondary issues that do divide us and destroy us that shouldn't. Spiritual gifts. There may be some people in here that are is so opposed to even the thought of someone speaking in tongues, they would walk out the building. I'm not even suggesting that tongues is or is not a spiritual gift. I'm saying that you're so divided against it that you won't even discuss it. What, you've taken a secondary issue and you've made it a key issue. How about baptism? I was at a church and this guy, there was a guy scared to death of going in the water. I don't know how he took a bath. I'm assuming he did. Or a shower. But I mean, he was, he was terrified. It was something, maybe it was just he was afraid to be dunked by a pastor. I don't know, but he was, he was truly scared. And the church would not let him join a Baptist church in our association because he refused to be immersed. Really? The thief on the cross? Did he not receive the same promise? Today I tell you the truth, truly, truly, you'll be with me in paradise. When did he get baptized? When was that? I forgot. Do I believe in immersion? Yeah. But not to the point that I'm just going to freak out, pull out what little hair that I have, and not talk to somebody because of it. I have friends who believe in the prosperity gospel. I think that they're so far, as, they're so far wrong, it's not even funny. As long as, they, as long as they hold truth to Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, and they preach the gospel right there, I'm going to, you know what? We have things that we're united on. Let's talk. Let's discuss it. We've had this, we've had these, I mean, these issues come up um, in, in, in our culture today, way back when. This is more worship style. This piano was an abomination from hell. Did you know that? Anybody tell me why? Huh? It what came from a bar. All of these did. Upright piano. These pianos were bar pianos. They started bringing them into the church. Is this worth the hill to die on? No. No. Dietary issues in the Bible. Some the, the uh, meat was being uh, sacrificed to to. Um, to, uh, to, to other gods, and, and Paul was saying, listen, if, if you know what, they're not really gods, you're free to eat, but if you come around somebody who, who says that they are, you don't need to be forcing it on them. I mean, there's no reason to fight. There's no reason to get divided over this. There are so many things that, that we come across on our daily basis that we hold, that we put more weight onto it than what we should. Randy, what, what, what is the history behind this? This, you do in remembrance in me, and what's the other one? It's do this in remembrance of me on the table. And what was the other one? This bread? Oh, uh, this, is my body. this is my body. The church was so divided. They've got, what, two sides right there. So you can just pop one. 
Are these issues that we fight and die on? No. No, there are fundamentals, yes, that we should. I think we should be united in our mission to make mature disciples who make mature disciples, to become mature disciples, making mature disciples. I think that we need to be united on who our Lord is. On who our Lord is. The first Corinthian church got that mixed up. Did you see that? It says right here, my brother, some of you in closed household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. That's Peter. Another says, I follow Christ. Real quick background right there. I want to walk down there. I'm not going to. The Apostle Paul. This guy was a super duper star. This guy was, he was kind of like Mark Driscoll. Anybody a Mark Driscoll fan? Anybody? Just just me? Okay. And Okay, he admitted to it. This guy was a church planter. He'd go into a different area. He'd go into it. He planted church. He'd go into a different area. He was a super plant churcher. Peter, what was Peter's fame to claim? Peter was, he was passionate. Anybody here list Tony Evans? That dude can preach. I'll listen to him talk about toilet water. That dude can preach. He's passionate. He goes in there. He gets in your face. And he'll knock you down. And then you have uh, Apollos. Apollos was uh, Acts 18. He was a super preacher. Absolutely. He was like Billy Graham of our day. And then you have the other. Well, you have the one that says they follow Christ. Please do not misread this. They don't follow Christ right here. Well, Paul... Paul was making a, a, a point that there are people out there that are, that are super duper Christians and, 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 and they don't need the church. They don't need spiritual leaders because all they, all they have is Jesus and I don't need anybody else. I'm just, I'm a super duper Christian. We have this in our day and age. I'm debating with the guy right now that rejects everything that Paul wrote in the Bible. The only thing I accept is what Jesus said. Paul was wrong. Absolutely wrong. It's like he wrote a third of the Bible. No, he's wrong because he's not Jesus. It's like, dude, you just, I mean, you've done something that the Bible doesn't say. I mean, it says all scripture is God breathed. You just rejected that. The American church does that too, don't we? We've been in meetings right here where somebody says, This is what Pastor Hagee said. Who? Pastor Hagee. Big guy, fat dude. I'm not, not I mean, it's not. Pastor Hagee says this. Shiny tooth. Oh, man. Shiny tooth. I wish I had a picture of shiny tooth. Shiny tooth, he says this. He says that if you, if you just have faith, you're going to get a job. That's what shiny tooth says. He's got nice suits, too. He's pretty. Some of you don't know who Shiny Tooth is. Some of you might be listening to Shiny Tooth, too. And you'd be like, when you found out, you'd be like, oh, he was talking bad about Shiny Tooth. (laughs) Uh, Hold on. But some of you, what about, uh, I don't know, think of some, some, what about uh, Billy Graham? Sometimes there are Christians who are like, before I make any decision whatsoever, I'm going to go to this different commentator and I'm going to see what he says on the matter. And what he says, that's where I'm going to go. John Piper, what does John Piper say on it? And if John Piper says it, that's my man, that's my guy, that's my dude. A Christian pastor, teacher, a leader who is worth his weight and salt as a pastor, a teacher, a spiritual leader is not to be followed in the sense that truth comes from him. They are a conduit. They tell you what Jesus told them. They tell you what the Bible says. They tell you what that, your ultimate, ultimate leader is always Jesus Christ. What does he say? You weigh what I say against him. And when I go away from him, you fire me and get a better looking guy. Probably not going to happen. Southern Baptists don't have a lot of good looking guys. I'm one of the rare ones. You fire me. And if I ever go away from the scripture, you ought to. Well, the pastor, he's always right. No. He's a man. Or a woman. No, 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 no! Secondary issue. You're probably wrong. 
but we need to discuss it. Shiny tooth. I did like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.16. He said, Therefore I do urge you to imitate me. For this reason I am sending you, uh, Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with everything that I teach everywhere in, my church, in, in, in the church. I absolutely 100% believe that um, your, your teachers and, and pastors should be followed, but only in the sense as they, they demonstrate what it means to be a mature Mature follower of Jesus Christ. So question number four, what is at the heart of division and unity? Let's start real quick with division. I'll get to unity. We'll be done in a few. Um, at the heart of division is immaturity and worldliness. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4 says this, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready for it. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Paulus, are you not mere men? I've seen that in my house. Children fight. They fight over everything, don't they? Toys. My kids, Kyle and Andrew, and now Lauren's there. She's fighting. I mean, the, we got a little puppy. It's a chocolate lab. I call it dog. They got it a new name. They call it blue. And it is cute. It, it's, it poops. Um, I, we're, we're working on that, making sure, you know, where do you go outside and everything like that. But the kids, they won't, they fight over the dog. It's like this dog is going to be part of this house for 15 years. They fight over it. Mine. Even Isabella's on it. Andrew came down to hold the dog, and Isabella was holding onto the dog's face like, it's mine. My dog. <laughs> she's Miss Independent. I'm going to tell you what, I'm scared of her. She's dancing in the church. I'm against that secondary issue. I don't really debate it with her, but I'm telling you what, she is, she don't, uh, uh, I hold her hand, she's like, Ma, I'm walking. Car seat, no. Girl, I'm going to call your mom. <laughs> Fight over everything. Over the superficial stuff too, don't they? Over their rights. It's not, oh, you've heard this, haven't you? It's not fair. <laughs> they, it's like they have a timer, don't they? He played that video game for 23.7 minutes, and I only got it for 21.9 minutes. It's not fair. I'm like, shut up, Kyle. You're like 22 years old. <laughs> Let Isabella have her turn. <laughs> Our Christians do the same thing, though, don't they? We fight over the superficial. Race, really? The pigmentation of somebody's skin? Come on. Socioeconomics? Oh, well, oh if somebody's got money, you know, hey, they must be doing stuff right. That was one of the problems in the Corinthians church. Color of carpet. Churches fall apart because of the color of carpet. We let the superficial tear us apart. Destroys our witness. Stagnates us for the kingdom. But the heart of unity is Christian maturity. We'll be reading about the mind of Christ here very soon. Um... Also about the passion of Christ as we see it in the Corinthians church. I've shared this with you a thousand times and I'm about ready to end. i got one more question uh, to deal with and I'll do this really quick. But I, I do want to share with this. I, I, I don't know why, but it, uh, it, it, it irks me. And I try to set these Christians aside. I try to, um, I, I, I try to hold their hands and I try to remind them, watch out what you say in front of unbelievers. They will take what you say and they will use it against your Lord. They will use the ammunition that you give them to shoot 
at Jesus. At his body, at his church. Very careful what you say. Is, does it need to be discussed? Yeah, if there's a problem, we need to discuss it. Does it need to be debated? Yeah, if there's a problem, let's debate it. All right, is, is there a problem within the church? Absolutely, let's bring it in. Let's lay it out. Let's say it right now. Okay, this, you guys are divided. You're taking care of one group. Uh, you're making sure this group gets fed while these people are starving or, or these people are getting drunk. You know, let's talk about it. Let's debate it, but let's do it here. Paul says, you know what? I would rather you be wronged than to take these problems out into the ungodly because they will beat your Lord Jesus up with it. They'll give you a listening ear while you say it. They'll encourage you to keep saying bad things and bad things and bad things, and they will justify their evil actions, and they will take it out, and they will smear the name of the church. Be very careful with what you say because of your fight with Christians right there. Question five, what shall we do? I think that we need to make unity a priority. Here's how I handled it with the last church. If... Um, uh, and again, I wasn't, I wasn't a paid minister or anything like that, but um, I think you do two things. You rebuke disunity. In the name of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you, let's be united. Part two. I will walk away from disunity. Unless the Lord God calls me to stay there. Why? Because I have neither the time nor the energy to waste with worldly, immature, baby kids when the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be preached to a dying world. If you want to fight, fight. But as for me and my household, we're going to preach the Lord. We're going to do everything that we can so that the message of Jesus Christ does not go unheard or in vain, as the, Apostle Paul, or as the Apostle Paul said, for Christ did not send me for this, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied. I'm going to close with this. John 13, 35 Jesus says that there is a trait that is going to be able to identify what his Christians look like. Nate, stand up for a second. Darren, step, step up for a second. And let me get uh, uh, Tamara. Come up here. Over here. Right here. All right. Right here. Okay. Let's turn around there. And then don't look at me like that. <laughs> don't get back. That's not that trait. All right. Stand over here with them. Okay. There's a trait that you need to closely look at to see these guys are really Christian, okay? There's a trait. Let's start with, with him. I know for a fact that I've been in, in, in a church before that if this man got up to speak, there'd be some problems. Two things. What, what's, what's wrong? Huh? T-shirt? What else? Shorts, he's got tattoos. There would be problems. I kid you not, they would be, he would be rebuked. I, I, I'm not kidding, I've seen that, I've seen that. I saw John LaFont one time had a shirt that said, uh, what does it say, Jesus is my homeboy. And that's John LaFont, you know what, John LaFont, he needs to be beaten the head, we know that, we love him, he's traveling, but anyway, but anyway, they just beat him to daylights. All right, just stand over here. We're not done with you. Oh, Tamra. Is there anything about Tamra that some people might disqualify her as being Christian? What? I have extra. You have extra? I've been dyeing my hair gray. You thought it was natural. No. <laughs> Those are superficial things, aren't they? But, no, but we have Darren. Okay, now hold on. Stand straight. Stand straight. Look at this. Oh, he's got a tie. 
a pen. Let me get my prayer card out for you, right? It is nice. <laughs> Watch, ring, shiny shoes. Token Christian. Jesus never says anything on the, on the outside. He says, you will know them for their love for one another. You'll be able to identify them from afar. You'll be like, that's one right there. That's one. Disunity and division shows no love for one another, but hatred, animosity, selfishness, and fighting for the kingdom. As I look out in this room, and as I look right here, all the differences of opinions, of worship styles, of the way we look, intelligent level, everything. I see a room full of people who love each other. One of the reasons why I would never, never want to willingly leave something like this for the ungodly churches of division, not unless the Lord tells me. And then we do what we're called. Amen. Thank you guys. Give him a hand and let's pray. <laughs> Bow with me. Father God, thank you for um, your words on, on unity and uh, uh, on division, Father. Um, I, uh, I know that there was a lot of things that we did not cover today. Um, your scripture is, is, is full. Father, we know that Jesus prayed for unity for, amongst his believers. One thing is, one of the things that he, he prayed for us, he said, Father, I pray that they're united like we're united. Like, like, the, like the triune God in heaven is united. I pray that the believers are united, Father, that, that, that we do come together and that we do, Father, even allow the shortcomings of life not to become a division. Your word says that love covers a multitude of sins, Father. And when we have this ultimate, when we have this love for one another, we can blow it. We can blow it. We can do things that we're not supposed to do, say things that we shouldn't do, repent. And, Father, there's this unity. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. We can even be divided. But if we'll come back together, in the name of Jesus Christ, who leads us all, the unity, the fellowship of believers, the real fellowship of believers happens here. It is in the precious blood I pray. Amen.